Good morning. Welcome to our services here at the Springdale Free Will Baptist Church. I'm going to depart from our Revelation study for a while. Uh, I've just got some health issues, and I think I had explained it in the the last recording that we made. Uh, In fact, two weeks ago today, I was in the hospital and was unable to be here. Um, I'm still having those issues, not feeling 100%, but I felt like the Lord led me to come and preach anyway. And this morning, I want to preach... The title of the message is The Light of the World is Jesus. We're getting close to the Christmas time uh, season, but not just because of Christmas. It's also tonight at sundown is when the Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah. And I believe this message will help us to understand why they have that festival or this feast of dedication, or sometimes they call it the Feast of Lights. And they begin to light the menorah, their, their candles. The light of the world is Jesus. And if you would pray for me as I continue, I need uh, the strength of God's people to help me through, and I believe the Lord will help me. Heavenly Father, as we begin to look at this message this morning, speak to our hearts and lives. Help us, dear Lord, to know without a shadow of a doubt, Lord Jesus, that you are the light of the world. You're the Savior of the world. You're the only hope for man's sinful and wicked condition. Please bless me and help me to continue through this message Without incident, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter number 1, verse 3, that in the beginning, God said, let there be light. Light is really important to us. We wouldn't be alive if it weren't for light. Light comes in all manners and forms, in fact, in many ways that you and I can't see with our eyes. It's part of what in science we call the electromagnetic spectrum. God said, let there be light. Do you know this universe then filled with light when God said that? And it would yet be several days before God would create the sun. So the light in this universe did not come from the sun that God placed in the sky, but rather it's the light of God himself. Not only did in the beginning God say, let there be light, but God has used light throughout man's history. We can find through the pages of the Bible, for instance, that there came a time when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush. God was in that burning bush. It was all lit up. Moses went to see what was going on. And God spoke to Moses, said, you're standing on holy ground. Do you remember as Moses led the Israelites through the wilderness, God provided a pillar of fire by night, sort of like a heavenly heater to keep them warm in that cold desert. Well, That's not the only time. David, the psalmist, said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. In Isaiah 9, 2, the scripture says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Isaiah was foretelling the birth of Jesus Christ, that he would come to a world filled with darkness, and he would shine his light upon them. So, In all honesty, Christ Jesus was the light of the world. He was born at nighttime to show that his light could vanish the darkness. He is that beautiful star of Bethlehem. And that might have been another good song that we could sing in the near future. He is the beautiful star of Bethlehem. He is the light of the world. He was the bright light that was seen by the disciples on the hill of the transfiguration. He is the same bright light who blinded the eyes of Saul of Tarsus when he stopped them on that road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And that day, Saul, who later was called Paul, got saved. He met Jesus. Christ Jesus is the light of heaven. We have studied in the book of Revelation recently, and we find in Revelation 21 and 22, there's no need of the sun because the lamb is the light thereof. God will light up all of this universe with his holy presence. Doesn't the Bible also teach us in Psalm 119 that the Bible is a a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path? 
God gives his light. In John 1, John described about the Lord Jesus Christ, starting in verse 4, he said, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Have you ever thought to yourself, what is darkness? Well, darkness is the absence of light. There's darkness when there's no light presence. If you walk into a dark room, there's no use of standing there complaining about the darkness, is there? Turn on the light. One light will overcome the darkness. Light a candle, a lamp, carry a flashlight. If the light bulb's burned out, you probably have other lights in the house. In other words, we can use lights to conquer and overcome darkness. So, in a way, the Bible teaches us that we are to be lights for Jesus, to let our light shine, right? We are to let our light shine to overcome the darkness of sin in the world around us. I would suggest to you that the world walks in three kinds of darkness. First of all, the world walks in mental darkness. Romans chapter 1 says that when people knew God, they worshipped him not as God. They turned to idols. They rejected God. The Bible said that professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They turned the glory of God into things of nature to worship. That's mental darkness. People have always wondered pretty much about the answers to what we could call the three great questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going when I leave this place? Well, the world doesn't have any good answers to those questions. But the Word of God does. You see, the Bible answering the question, who am I, teaches us that we are a direct and special creation of God. He formed us in our mother's womb. He designed us. He knew us before we even saw the light of day at our birth. We are a special creation of God. And you know, the Bible teaches me that I am made in the image of God. And so are you. Amen? The second question, why am I here? The Bible makes it clear that we are here for the purpose of bringing glory to God. That's our calling. That's our job in life. If you don't do anything else in your life, at least live to bring glory to God. Because if you won't do it in this life, you're not going to be in heaven to do it throughout eternity. You've got to be saved. And if you get saved, that brings glory to God. And where am I going? The Bible shows us that there's only two destinies. It's either heaven or hell, right? You're either going to be in the presence of God for eternity or you're going to be banished from his presence and be cast eventually into that lake of fire. There's no other alternative. But you are the one who gets to decide where you will spend eternity. If you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you'll be saved. But if you reject his gift of salvation, you're lost and you'll suffer eternal damnation. How sad. In fact, I think we could safely conclude that most people walk in darkness because they choose to. The world is in mental darkness. Secondly, I suggest to you the world is in moral darkness. It seems like we're living in a day that has fulfilled what Isaiah 5 was talking about when he said, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil that trade darkness for light and light for darkness. What this world calls good, God calls sin. And what God calls good, the world calls bad. We're in an upside-down world. They scoff at things that are morally good, and they praise those things of low morality, and it's getting worse and worse. Washington, D.C., and Hollywood, and the news media are, in my opinion, a sewer of wickedness and immorality. I really believe it is. It's getting worse as time goes on. So not only is there mental darkness and moral darkness, but thirdly, there's also spiritual darkness. Remember, I said that we are created to worship God and bring him glory. But the problem is, <clears throat> the devil has led most people 
to worship the things that God has created. There were two fellows who worked together as carpenters day after day. One of them was kind of like a wise guy. He was always picking on and teasing the other one. The second one was, oh, he wasn't real smart. Let's say his his light bulb wasn't putting out as much as it should be. <clears throat> one night, the guy who did the, did the teasing shined his flashlight up to the second uh, story of a house, and he said, would you mind climbing up this light beam and get me my hammer? The nitwit said, ha. How dumb do you think I am? The wise guy said, well, I'm sorry. The dumb guy said, well, you should be. You, you know full well that you let me get halfway up that light and then turn the light off. <laughs> I don't know how you climb a light beam. I've never been able to do that. But truthfully, God has placed his light in three places. God's light is placed in the scriptures. David said, the entrance of thy word giveth light and giveth understanding. Secondly, God has placed his light in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, God has placed his light in the truly born again saints of God, you and me. There is plenty of light available if the world would just believe and call upon the Lord. In John chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus said, I, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. There was a little boy who was afraid of the dark. Were some of you like that when you were growing up? Right? Most everybody is somewhat terrified of the dark. Well, one night his mama told him to go out on the back porch and bring her broom. The little boy turned to his mother and he said, Mama, he, he, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. And mama said, you don't have to be afraid of the dark. Jesus is out there. He'll look after you and protect you. So the little boy looked at his mom real hard and said, Are you sure he's out there? She said, Yes, I'm sure. He's everywhere. And he's always ready to help you when you need him. Well, that's true, isn't it? The little boy thought about what his mama said for a minute. Then he went to the back door and cracked that door open just a little bit. As he peeked out into the darkness, he called, Jesus, if you're out there, would you please hand me the broom? <laughs> I don't know that the Lord Jesus handed him the broom that night. <laughs> but I do know that Jesus is the light of the world, because that's what the Bible tells me. He's the light of the world who casts out darkness, the darkness in our souls. Jesus told this to the Pharisees, and I'll be reading in John 8, verse 12 in just a minute. Before I tell you what Jesus told the Pharisees, tonight about sunset, as I mentioned earlier, faithful Jews will celebrate Hanukkah, the festival of dedication, or also they call it the festival of lights. They'll begin by lighting the first candle of the menorah, the Jewish candle. And maybe you've seen pictures of that before, where it's got these little curved up stems, and uh, there might be seven or nine of them, and they would hold the lights. The design for the tabernacle in the wilderness and then later on in the temple had a golden candlestick and it was fed with oil, that olive oil that was burning to provide the light within uh, God's presence, God's house. So this festival of lights or the festival of dedication is celebrated by Jews every year. But most Christians don't understand much about this special time. Would it surprise you though that that same night that Jesus was here on the earth, according to John chapter number 8, he went to the temple during Hanukkah. He observed that, that festival of lights or festival of dedication. John 8, verse number 12. Then Jesus spake again unto them, talking about the Pharisees, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, before I read in John 10 about where he actually was there at the temple, you know, this, this is sort of continuous on in his discussion with these religious leaders. But I want to give you a little bit of historical background. From the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament was a period of about 400 years. During that 400 years, there was no prophet. 
There was no word from God. There was no scripture that was given. The land of Israel was under control of the Romans for quite a while, as well as the Greeks um, who had come before that. When Alexander the Great died, the Grecian Empire was divided among his four generals. The wicked general Antiochus IV ruled over Israel. The Jews called him Antiochus the Madman, but he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, trying to convince them that he was a manifestation of one of the Greek gods. He wanted them to worship him. He set up a statue and commanded the people worship at that statue. A few miles outside of Jerusalem lived a family called the Maccabees. This was a Levitical family. The men served as priests, and their job was to take care of the temple, to make sure the temple was stocked with what it was supposed to have, with the oil for the lamps, with the showbread, and to make sure that everything was in order. But because of this wicked Antiochus Epiphanes, who hated the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who hated the Jews and hated their system of worship, and because of their intense persecution, they were unable to go to the temple for a while. In about 165 B.C., this family got together, and it was a pretty big family, had a lot of relatives. They decided they were going to try to fight against this occupying general. It wasn't easy, but they used a form of guerrilla warfare. Rather than lining up their armies face-to-face -face like many armies used to fight, they would go and sneak attacks. And they kept this up over a period of time. It took quite a while, but they finally drove the enemy out of the land uh, or out of that city of Jerusalem. Once they got them out, the priest made a pilgrimage to go the few miles to get to the temple. It was kind of sad what they found. Now, this is the same family that refused to bow down and worship that statue of Antiochus. But they traveled to the temple in Jerusalem, and their purpose was to rededicate the, the temple. What they found there horrified them. This Antiochus Epiphanes had sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. And pork was anathema to the Jews. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. It was an unclean animal. So what these men had to do is to remove the stones of that altar and get them out of the temple because they had been defiled and could no longer be sanctified. They built a new altar... And in addition, um, as they replaced that altar, they also checked on the oil of the lamp. And they discovered that by the time they had that altar ready to go, there was only enough oil left for that lamp to burn one more day. That was a problem. Because they needed to harvest and pick the ripe olives. They had to press them and crush them to produce the oil. The oil had to be cured and purified and sanctified, and it would take about eight days to do all that. Well, the priest trusted that God would provide. Have you learned in your life that the Lord takes care of his children? Even in the midst of my physical problems, the Lord's with me, and he's providing for me. They found out that that one day's worth of oil for the lamp continued to burn that lamp until the eight days were up to where they had the purified oil. That was a miracle of God. But it's not necessarily a surprise, is it? God fed the Israelites for 40 years out in the wilderness. He can do that. Jesus took the bread and the loaves later on and broke it and fed 5,000 men plus women and children. We find that in the days of Elijah, uh, he went and the, the widow made him uh, a pancake, so to speak, or a little uh, loaf of bread so he could eat. And she said that would be the last meal. Didn't have uh, enough oil and, and meal to make another meal. But God extended that. And during that whole time of the, the, uh, of the uh, uh, lack of rain, that drought, God supplied so that that woman and her family had enough to eat. Our God is a miracle working God. So they were rejoiced over that miracle. They had got everything ready and they prepared to dedicate this new altar and dedicate the temple once it was sanctified. 
And so the Jews then began an eight-day feast that is called Hanukkah. That's how they refer to it today. Or the feast or festival of dedication. Let's look in John chapter 10. And I'm going to start with verse 22. This story will tell us, will tell us of when Jesus Almost 200 years later, after they started this Hanukkah celebration, he went to the temple. Verse 22 of John 10. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication. Well, right there it is. And it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. I already told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Did Jesus tell them? Yeah, we read about that back in chapter number 8, verse 12. You remember? Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He said, I am the light of the world, because they were making preparations to celebrate this festival or feast of lights. Well, they still would not believe in the Lord Jesus. But I'm thankful for many through the ages who have believed in him. Hanukkah is the celebration of the dedication of the temple and the festival of light. The Jews in Jesus' day demanded that Jesus plainly tell them if he was the Christ or the Messiah. He said, I already told you, but you won't believe me. Jesus plainly said he's the light of the world. And he went on to teach these religious leaders that they were from the earth. They were earthly, from below. But he was from above, from heaven. And that in their sinful, wicked condition, they'll never make it there. They'll never go there. For each of the eight days of Hanukkah, one of the candles of that menorah lamp is lit. The people rejoice. They celebrate. They eat specially prepared food. Uh, the, The candles of the menorah lit one by one until they're all lit up. And uh, they rejoice at the presence of God in their lives. God has given his light to the world. The problem is most of the Jews and most Gentiles don't understand that Jesus is the light of the world. Friend, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today, if you know he's your light and your salvation, rejoice. Be thankful that God loves you and that God saved you. But if you don't know Jesus today, You don't walk in the light. You're in darkness. And you're going to end up in the fires of eternal judgment. I wouldn't want that for you, neither would anybody else here in our congregation. If you have not called ever on the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior and God, if you've not repented of your sin, if you've not accepted him as your personal Savior, let me tell you today, he loves you with an everlasting love. The Bible says you've got to repent. And believe that Jesus Christ paid your sin debt. And that you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That he is your light and your salvation. If you do that, Romans 10 says you're saved. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you'll receive that gift of salvation. I hope that this message has touched your heart in a way today. It's a little different than my usual messages But there's a lot of historical significance that helps us when we study about things like this feast of dedication. Jesus went to the temple to show, I'm dedicated to serving God Almighty, and I'm celebrating these lights because he is the light of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all you've done. Thank you for your amazing grace and your amazing love. Dear Lord, I just ask that you continue to be with us and help us to walk in righteousness and in truth. Thank you for giving me the strength to complete this message, I believe, to the point of where you're satisfied, Lord. And I pray that you would minister to the hearts and lives, not just of this congregation, but of people who watch this recording at a later date. Lord Jesus, I love you. And Lord, if you come again, Before the next time we meet, glory to God, I'm ready, and I hope everybody else is ready. But should you tarry, Lord, help us to be found faithfully serving you and worshiping you. I ask in Jesus' precious name, amen.